Hi guys, I'm back in my local Toyota dealership collecting a brand new vehicle. No, it's not mine. I was contacted about two months ago by a couple in Germany saying to me, we would love to have our own Land Cruiser permanently based in Australia. Could you build one for us? And I said yes. I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and then traveling to the remotest parts of the world. This is a Toyota Land Cruiser 76 series wagon. A five-seat station wagon and I'm going to convert it into a vehicle suitable for personal outback expedition and exploration. And as I do it, share with you the principles I use to choose each and every component of its build. I am asked a lot of questions about how to equip a four-wheel drive vehicle. And it's always a difficult question to answer because I have to precede it by answering my own, asking my own question. And that is, well, what are you going to do with it? So every component, without exception, that one adds to a four-wheel drive to accessorize it and to modify it and to get it right for one's own use, <clears throat> you have to say, well, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to go climbing over rocks? Am I going to need a huge range? Which means I need maximum payload because of maximum fuel load. Am I going to go away for a weekend or a week? or a month and where what kind of terrain am I going to be tackling on my way there or is the road itself the route itself the destination all of these questions are, in are incredibly important to ask and answer because if you don't you'll f likely fit something that a is unnecessary and be just plain unfit for purpose so now <clears throat> bringing your vehicle to a store such as ARB to have the vehicle equipped you need to have some answers in your head before you come to a place like this because they won't necessarily ask the right questions hopefully they will but they if they don't you're gonna need to be armed with some information and before, so you can ask them the right questions. The first stop is my local ARB store and workshop. The principles of vehicle protection are very simple. What are you protecting your vehicle against? Now, the obvious one is a bull bar, a rhubar, bull bar, all those names really mean frontal protection, mainly from impact with animals. Some countries it's very important, other countries it's less important. And, well, what are the locals fitting to their vehicle? The second part about vehicle protection is not quite as obvious. Vehicle protection underneath, what are the most vulnerable parts of the vehicle? What kind of driving are you doing? Are you driving over rocks? Are you doing a lot of rock crawling? Are you driving through incredibly tall grass? How vulnerable is the underside of your vehicle? Because remember, every piece of protection equipment is made out of steel or very heavy aluminium. It's extra weight. It's difficult to clean. And now with lots of uh, underbody plating, difficult to access underneath the vehicle. So, fitting protection gear that you really don't need costs a lot of money costs a lot of weight, costs a lot of fuel, and costs a lot of performance. And I've limited it to really the, fr the front of the vehicle. Um, ARB bar, I like the bar, I like the way they look. They're very, very strong. I actually hit um, two kangaroos in the same evening a couple of months ago, and uh, there was, was a hell of an impact. No damage at all to the vehicle, nothing to the bar. I like them, and they're very well respected. They also supplied this, um, this basically protects, mostly protects the radiator. A vulnerable part of the front of the vehicle is the radiator because if you're driving through sticks and things can move around and because you've got belts in the front of the vehicle, that's vulnerable. So a stick can come up, puncture the radiator, damage the radiator and pull belts off 
the engine, which obviously will stop the engine. So that's limited protection. The next stage would be to take this and extend it a little bit further to afford some protection to the steering bar and the steering damper. Uh, but again, the more protection you add to the vehicle, you're adding quite a lot of weight and also you're adding to your maintenance because if you now want to put protection plates under the gearbox and engine, you have to then remove them every time you want to do servicing of the gearbox and the engine. So again, it's a compromise. This particular vehicle for the client, the client is going touring. He will be doing some off-roading, but primarily he's going touring. So I considered that enough. In this case, I've also added protection to the side front of the vehicle and these rock sliders will prevent damage to the side of the vehicle in the event of the vehicle rolling on a rock and landing on the side sill. A very common question with people building vehicles, especially for the first time, is do I need a winch? They think they do most of the time. And the question is, what kind of terrain are you going to be driving over? And are you going off-roading where there is a high chance of not only you getting stuck, but your mates getting stuck as well, and you want to be able to help them out? If the answer is, oh yes, that's what I want to do, then you need a fitter winch. Really cool. Otherwise, maybe it's, no, I don't really want to get stuck, but what happens if I do? These are an insurance policy. It's just that little bit of comfort sitting on the front of your vehicle. How big do I need it? In other words, how much power do I need? Uh, you need to get some advice from your store. Hopefully they'll give you good advice, but I'm going to give you a basic guide now. If you've got a medium-sized SUV, which is reasonably heavily loaded for an overland uh, touring trip, you're going to need about a 9,000 pound winch. So 9, 10, 11 or 12. Anything more than 12 is overkill. And the other thing that I recommend in the modern day is you use a plasma rope. Plasma rope on a winch saves an average of around 10 kilograms. And that might not seem a lot, but I promise you it is. Particularly because it's hanging right off the front of the vehicle. Any weight that is hanging off the front or hanging off the back is not where you want weight. So 10 kilograms is significant. So I do recommend a plasma rope. And how much should you spend? Well, if you're the kind of guy that loves to go out and is going to use your winch a lot, then spend on your winch. And there are plenty of good quality budget winches available and the best way to find out which brand is to find out what other people like. Because my client won't use his winch a lot, um, maybe never, I mean but if he does use it it'll be once a year if that. So I chose to get him a Revo winch, I've never heard of them actually, I was told they're quite good, good price and, and with a plasma rope to keep it light. But there is another consideration. My client might not use it for two, three, four years, and during that time he goes wading. So in other words, the, 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 the winch is immersed in water. And this isn't an expensive winch, so it's not waterproof. It might be water resistance, but if some water gets in and it just sits there, there is a possibility further down the line that the winch will not work when he really needs it to. So you either buy an expensive winch and hardly ever use it, or you have the winch serviced reasonably regularly if you're driving in deep water. But in terms of recovery equipment, the most important thing that you need to make sure your vehicle has, no matter what it is, how much modifications you do to it, if you're going off-road, you have to make sure there is some way of recovering your vehicle. In other words, recovery points. Don't confuse them with lashings. Many vehicles have lashing points that are used for storing the vehicles on ships to stop them moving around. They are not the same as recovery points. Here the rear bumper has two of them and there are also two on the front. As part of the winch what I've done for the client is purchased a pretty straightforward fairly simple recovery kit but what I've added to it is this. This is called a pulley block or a snatch block and it basically doubles the pulling power of a winch by halving the, the length of the cable. And the details of that really deserve their own video. I'm not going to go into it now, but I have put together a simple recovery kit with gloves and things and a few safety items for the client. 
differential locks, now let me just be clear before I continue, I'm talking about differentials between left and right wheels. So all vehicles have at least two of them, one on the back axle, one on the front axle. Some vehicles, permanently driven four-wheel drive vehicles, have a third one in the middle. I'm only going to talk about the ones on the axles. Do I need a differential lock? I think I'm jumping ahead of myself a bit. Let me just, just go back to a little bit of basics. The principle of a differential is this. Left and right wheels, when a vehicle goes around a corner, they travel actually rotate at different speeds. And what a differential allows is that differential wheel speed. However, when you're driving over rough terrain, you don't want differential wheel speed. You want both wheels pulling together, which doesn't happen. And without a differential lock, one wheel can spin madly and the other wheel remain stationary. So obviously a differential lock is going to help off-road. And the answer is no, you don't need one. I travelled for decades touring all over Africa and I never had an actual locker. However, in the modern day, so many vehicles come out with rear axle differential locks as standard that you will be at a disadvantage when driving with your mates if you don't have one. Do I need one in the back and front? No, you really don't need that. But you only need a differential lock when driving over uneven terrain. Beach driving, flat driving, mud driving, you don't need one and sometimes you actually don't want one because using the differential lock all the time when driving is probably going to turn you into quite a bad driver. Much better not to have a differential lock, learn, 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 and when you get into a bit of trouble, then use it to get out of that trouble. At the end of the day, you're out of trouble, but you've learned a whole lot about your vehicle that you otherwise wouldn't have learned. Do you need an air pump? The simple answer is yes, you definitely need an air pump. Okay, bottom line, you have to have one because off-road, you're going to be reducing your tire pressures for added flotation, and added traction. It's an absolute must. And you've got to be able to reinflate them when you're done and you get back onto the road. So it's an absolute yes to that. However, how much do you need to spend? Now, if you're just starting out and you're just using your vehicle for touring occasionally and you occasionally get onto the beach or onto a soft piece of sand, do I need to spend a lot? No, you don't. And something like this product they're made in China they're not particularly expensive they're pretty fast they're pretty reliable they they just plain work it's very easy to overspend on air compressor pumps I'm going to show you one now that is a typical example of that and this is what I'm talking about this is a beautiful example of complete and utter overkill and that is why I have it in my vehicle, one just like this. They are fantastic. I can pump up, together with the reservoir in this the ARB system, I can pump up my tires faster than I can at a forecourt. I like that kind of thing. The compressor solution is a very straightforward one with a little modification. This I purchased from a local store. That's the big thing about a compressor. How fast? Because a lot of them, the cheap ones, basically turn electricity into noise. This one will pump a tyre, a set of tyres, really, really quickly. But I've improved the design because this came with a pretty horrible bag, with a camp cover bag. Now, the, the design behind the camp cover bag is quite good, you see, because the people who designed it knew what they were doing. You see, it's very, very nice to actually not have to take the pump out of the bag when pumping tires because if you can leave it in the bag it's protected from dirt and sand and muck but if it's in an enclosed bag it gets too hot so the fact that they have left it open like that means that it won't get too hot and it won't get really dirty i call that a nice little modification walking through a store if you're not familiar with a lot of equipment you might come across things like this Differential breather kit. What on earth is that? Well, very principally, the, uh, the differentials, the transmission, the gearbox in a motor vehicle have breathers. It allows the gases inside to expand and contract as they get hot and cool down. And if underwater and they cool down and contract, they suck in water, which is the last thing you want in a differential or a gearbox. Is it a good idea to put in a breather? But again, you've got to ask, how 
often are you going to be going into deep water and that kind of thing. Now, for myself, I avoid deep water because it can potentially damage the vehicle. But I still have these fitted. I still have breathers fitted because you only need to go into deep water once and you've got water in your, your oil and therefore you're potentially damaging the vehicle. So, is it a must have? Huh, maybe. Certainly worth considering and probably worth putting quite high up on the priority list. This is a very, very nice setup. We got uh, Perth Deers Performance to do it for us. A less expensive and equally effective alternative might have been a product, for example, Terrain Tamer make very similar products. Um, it's a DIY product, but at the end of the day, you've got um, just as much quality. And the, the, the part about doing it yourself is then you know how it's done, and then if you have a problem and have an issue, you know how it's put together. So do it yourself if you can, and it'll save you some money. Without exception, on the top of most people's lists, when they're looking at a vehicle, considering purchasing a vehicle, and then considering modifying it and upgrading it for touring, is do I need to change the suspension, upgrade the suspension, and what am I going to buy? And the choices are, un I mean, there are just so many choices, it ain't funny. The principle is this, if you are going to load your vehicle to close to its maximum, the standard springs and shocks are going to be working very, very hard to control that extra load over rough ground. So when we upgrade to gas shock absorbers, higher rate springs, etc., what we're basically doing is that now, ideally, the vehicle, even though it's very heavy and at close to maximum weight, the suspension is actually finding it quite easy because it's not working at the limit of its performance, it's working comfortably within its performance. So the first thing I would suggest to you do with your vehicle before you change the springs and before you do anything actually is go on a trip but if you are going to change anything with a suspension, you start with shock absorbers. Because the shock absorbers have the biggest effect in terms of controlling the load and controlling the vehicle. Then if you find your vehicle is battling because your load is very high and you feel as if higher, higher rate springs, in other words, a little bit of a lift will help that, then you go to the springs, but make sure that whatever springs you fit work in conjunctions with whatever shocks you fit. It's important to get that combination right. But why are gas shocks a good idea? A gas shock absorber will not cavitate at the high temperatures that these things, these things get unbelievably hot on corrugations and rough ground. And what happens is, that the oils inside a shock absorber cavitate, which means they actually get air in them. So you're not only just pushing oil through the, the, the controlling systems within the shock absorber, it starts pushing through air as well. And air is much thinner than oil, obviously. So what happens is they fade. It's called shock absorber fade. Standard shock absorbers, if they're not gas, will fade far quicker, far earlier and far sooner than a gas shock absorber. So that is why gas shocks should be quite high on your priority. Are they absolutely necessary? They are not absolutely necessary. But what is absolutely necessary is to upgrade the tyres. Are they suitable for the kinds of surfaces you're going to be driving over? Basically, if you're going to leave the asphalt this is a must-do first item. Perhaps the first thing you must understand is that four-wheel driving and overland touring are two different things and won't necessarily require two different tires, but certainly if your main objective is to go four-wheel driving and you want performance off-road, then that's going to be a different set of selection criteria than if you were just doing touring. These are the tyres and rims that I have selected for my client. There are a thousand videos, and half of them have made, been made by me, about tyres and tyre choices for overlanders. So what I'm going to talk now is about the principles of wheel, rim and tyre choices for overlanders. BF Goodrich KM3, and it's a very good touring tyre, but not a superb touring tyre. 
because being a mud tyre it's quite noisy and it consumes more fuel than would an all-terrain tyre but its strength is its strength now this client's vehicle is going to be spending 90% of its time touring and a good portion of that on rough off-road tracks his criteria is strength I want a tyre that can take a beating and I'm happy to put up with a higher fuel consumption and higher noise when on asphalt. We have changed the wheel rims. In this case, because the wider tyres specified by the client required wider rims. So therefore the question is, do you want comfort, fuel economy, or do you want strength? You can't have both. You can have a bit of both. So, for example, an alternative would be if I was looking at KM, uh, uh, B of Goodrich, they're all terrain tires. It's the same with other tire manufacturers. Almost all of them have those two choices. Using percentages, like this one is 70% and 30%, this one 50% on-road, 50% off, and 20% on-road, 80% off. That's quite a clever way of explaining a product in the simplest possible terms. Alloy rims are lighter, as strong, look better most of the time, but cannot be repaired nearly as easily as steel rims can when in the bush. Only when a vehicle is used in extreme conditions is this an important factor. Are you going to need a puncture repair kit? Well, hopefully you won't need it, but it's like a first aid kit. It's a good idea if you're carrying one. Now, in this particular sphere, it is so easy to get this completely and utterly wrong, particularly if you go on eBay and buy one that is the cheapest you can possibly find. The reason for that is that these things break, okay, and the vulcanizing rubber isn't high quality, the lubricant is not even included in many of the kits. Spend some money and get a good one. Basically, you've got vulcanized rubber strings that you push into the hole in the tire with that. I'm pushing too hard, so what I'm doing is, okay. And sometimes you have to use more than one. Oh, if it's the hole is too big. It's too big, yeah. So then I turn 90 degrees. Yeah. Ah. Okay, and I think we might have to put another one in there. But before you push it in, you clean out with, a, with, a, with that guy and good ones have always got a valve key and some spare valves. Okay, I've got two in there. That's a nice one actually, I like that. Dual battery charging. This is, a, this is a subject all on its own, potentially very, very complicated. Do I need a separate battery? Well, if you want to run a fridge and things like that, yes. Do you want a split charger? Principally, split charger means that the battery that's running the fridge, the way it's connected to the main vehicle battery and the way it is charged means that if the fridge takes all and fr completely flattens its battery, it doesn't affect the vehicle battery and the vehicle will still start. That's the principle. The choice of auxiliary battery is a subject all in its own, but I want to give you one little bit of advice, the principle that must be adhered to if you want to get maximum performance, no matter what battery you choose. The system used to charge that battery has to match the battery in the vehicle. So whether you go for a, a, a lithium, they're fantastic, they're amazing, they're quite expensive, they can really deliver lead crystal, awesome batteries, traditional deep cycle batteries, especially need taken care of, but will perform well if they're well matched to the charger, or even an ordinary car cranking battery actually works quite well as an auxiliary battery as long as you understand the pros and cons. There are many different types of batteries and many different types of battery charge systems. If the two don't match, it doesn't charge it properly. It charges it, but it doesn't charge it properly. That means you'll get very poor, potentially terrible performance out of your auxiliary battery and you might think there's something broken or there's something not working. Often the case is that the person who fitted it didn't understand this principle and gave you mismatched components. It's a very common in this industry. The choice of batteries, I've gone for lead crystal. 
mainly because I have lead crystal in my vehicle. You see, the thing is that the most important thing is about a battery system is not as much as how much current can it deliver in terms of its battery size. I mean, of course, it's important. How many amp per hour are you storing in the battery? But what is more important, or every bit as important, maybe more important, how good is the battery at accepting current back? So you, you can't assume that every battery is the same because they're absolutely not. If you, for example, take a traditional deep cycle battery and you just plug it into your, your alternator, it won't accept current if it's at a low state of charge easily at all, unless that current is modified. As I said before, it's important to match the battery with the charging system. Lead crystal are the hungriest batteries I have ever used. They suck up current like you will not believe. They're fantastic. And in terms of the comparison between that and, and, and uh, lithium, there are a few pros and cons either way. Not going to go into it now, but that's my choice. The Land Cruiser is delivered to a selection of local workshops for work to commence. In the next part, I talk suspension solutions, the rack and tent, electricals, packing systems, the fridge, fuel range and more. I would be worrying that they're going to arrive in a week's time and not like it because they had their heart set on a 76.